Hey everyone, I thought we'd do something a little different today and take a break from the usual videos. What we're going to do is look at some real concept designs that were posted a few years back on WWE.com. Everything you're going to see in this video is totally legit. These are sketches and drawings that came from the WWF or WWE creative team. Their early ideas of how a WWF superstar is going to look or sometimes their ideas for a character change or a change in wardrobe. These ideas would get pitched to the wider creative team, Vince McMahon and even the wrestlers themselves. And it can be really interesting to see how a superstar is envisioned during the early stages of development. Also, you've maybe seen these before. These have been on the WWE website for quite some time. So if you're someone who already has a keen interest in this type of thing, then you probably won't find anything new here. Just thought I'd give you a heads up so you don't waste your time. So let's get to it. Here's some early concept designs for a selection of WWF superstars. The first one we're going to look at is Razor Ramon. Scott Hall made his WWF debut in a dark match. The match happened in May of 1992, but the company were also running a series of vignettes that introduced the Razor Ramon character. It was easy to tell that Razor Ramon was based on Tony Montana, but this concept art does not give off any Scarface vibes at all really. Remember, it was Scott Hall who pitched the Montana-like character to Vince McMahon, so it's possible that this art was put together before Hall talked to the boss. The hat is one of the most notable things about the art. Scott Hall would not wear a hat at all during his days as Razor Ramon, and if we look closely, we also see Razor holding an actual razor, something that wouldn't carry over to the finished wrestler, although he did have a razor hanging off his gold chains. Razor seems to be wearing a different jacket here too, or maybe it was a shirt underneath his vest. And this also wouldn't carry over, but we can also see a few things that actually would get implemented into the Razor Ramon gimmick. First of all, the trademark toothpick is here. The previously mentioned gold chains that Razor would wear are also included in this artwork. The art also shows a vest that is very similar to the one Razor would wear. And the Razor Ramon logo on the vest and tights is pretty much the same one that was eventually used. Also, the long tights actually made an appearance during Razor's debut match. These would get changed over to trunks of course, but there's actually quite a few things here that would make it to TV. Here's Razor Ramon's buddy, the 123 Kid. The notes on this one state that Creative wanted to make him colourful and appealing to younger viewers. The numbers 123 were plastered all over the attire, and a bright palette was used to make Kid more appealing to, well, kids. Sean Waltman wasn't known as the 123 Kid upon his WWF debut. It took a few weeks before he got the name, so we can assume this artwork was put together in the middle of May of 1993. When Sean took on the 123 Kid name and he wrestled his first match on Raw, he wore an attire that's very similar to this one right here. And the colour schemes used in other designs were also used eventually in the 123 Kid's attires down the road. Kid would simplify his gear by getting rid of all those numbers and pastel colours, and it was definitely for the best. His later gear was much better than his debut gear. Here's one that's pretty confusing, it's Brett the Hitman Hart. It's difficult to place a date on these Hart designs, but we assume it's around the same time he started working in singles matches. But some of these drawings are truly baffling. First of all, this pink and black version isn't so bad and it uses the usual Hart Foundation colour scheme. The gold trimmings are new for sure. But then we get this white, gold and black variation and I'm going to admit I actually like this. I'm not so sure about the hearts placed on Brett's ass and the eagle design placed on his crotch, but the colour scheme itself I think looks good. And then we get this. Not sure what was going on here. The hitman carries some arrows and he's dressed like a futuristic archer or something, I don't know. I honestly don't know what they were going for here. They kept the eagle on his crotch though, so someone must have really liked that idea. 
thankfully this concept was scrapped. It looks really bizarre, but it's still kind of interesting. Here's The Rock in his Rocky Maivia attire. This artwork was put together one month before Rocky debuted and they were pretty much right on the money with this blue version here. This is the gear that Rocky debuted in at the 1996 Survivor Series. The design on his trunks was also initially going to be on his wristbands, but apart from that, everything looks perfect here. Even the style of boots that Rock would wear throughout his entire career are included in the artwork. There's also a few variations here. A shorter version of the entrance attire was once planned, and also a red variation was pitched, but this would never see the light of day. It would be cool to see concept art for The Rock from mid-1998 onwards, but I don't think any exists. This stuff here is pretty fascinating. This is Goldust, who debuted in late 1995. This one features a gold suit and a gold shirt. The buttons and trimmings were going to be diamond studded, and it gives us a much more serious impression of the bizarre one. In June of 1995 though, it looked like creative were still undecided on the character that Dustin Reynolds was going to play, as here's a concept art of a character named Stargate, a kind of Egyptian gimmick that's very very far away from what we got with Goldust. A character we could see Dustin portraying is the cowboy Dustin Reynolds, another idea that was pitched along with Stargate and this one is very reminiscent of the natural Dustin Rhodes. Another idea was pitched where Dustin would portray a character named Shadow Rhodes. Looks a little generic but I wonder what he was carrying in his little bag here. Going back to Goldust, there's an idea here that saw Dustin wearing a green attire and not the famous and outlandish gold outfit that would become a trademark of the character. But there was an alternate gold version of this same gear. It doesn't look too bad to me, but still not as good as the original. And here it is, right here. There's no face paint on gold dust at the moment and the gold gloves are missing, but this is pretty close to the finished product. Check this one out too, gold dust with a robe and long blonde hair. Does this version of gold dust remind you of anyone else? Another idea here seemed to have Dustin kind of being himself and also portraying gold dust. It's kind of half and half, at least judging by the artwork here. We have a lot of gold, but it's nowhere near as outlandish as the final version. There's a ton of Big Daddy Cool Diesel artwork here that was created around the beginning of 1995. So this was when Diesel was the World Wrestling Federation champion and when the company were pushing Kevin as their number one guy. Diesel's ring attire was already established, but it looks like the company wanted to try a few new things. The Diesel baseball cap was probably pitched as a piece of merchandise and nothing more, and the cap itself was released, although the concept art looks a little more elaborate. The Diesel logo was also going to be on Nash's back at one point, and Diesel wristbands were also going to make an appearance, so it looks like these designs were more about marketing ideas, ideas to make Diesel more retail friendly perhaps. Things get weird though when the WWF produces designs for your casual attire. Here's a big old coat for Diesel to wear when he isn't wrestling. Nash had worn similar coats in the past and even in 1995. Diesel would continue to wear this style of jacket, although it was all black. No idea what was going on here, but the WWF also designed this casual outfit for Diesel. You'll see a WWF title logo on the shirt and it's just bizarre, isn't it? I'd love to see Kevin Nash wear this stuff today. WWF suspenders were even designed for Big Daddy Cool at one point. The back had a WWF logo while the front looked like chains. And the WWF even designed workout gear for Diesel. Take a look.
Here's another formal outfit that was designed for Diesel and I could have sworn that I saw Diesel actually wear something like this during 1995. I tried to find it and I couldn't. So if you can recall when Diesel wore this suit or something similar, please solve the mystery and let me know in the comments. Okay, so after recording this part of the script, I sent out a tweet asking if anyone knew when the suit made an appearance. And thanks to a little help from Jay at OSW Review, I think I narrowed it down to that one commercial where Diesel wouldn't accept money for an autograph. You know, that really cheesy one where he says, I don't want your money. I think it's from that. So mystery solved, I think. There's stuff here for the Legion of Doom, including a ton of designs for the Rocco puppet. It looks like they settled on this one here, but there are a couple other designs here for the puppet who accompanied LOD in 1992, a puppet that Road Warrior Hawk absolutely hated. Here's some early ideas for Hawk and Animals tights too. Personally, I don't think any of these are better than the gear that they actually wore in the WWF. There's also a lot of artwork for LOD 2000 from 1998 and we can tell this is from 1998 by looking at the item received stamp in the corner. The date is scribbled out but we can still see the year. And what's fascinating here is that there's three members. There's an additional wrestler included along with Hawk and Animal. This could have been Draws or Puke as he was known when he joined LOD. But it's interesting to think that initially the idea for LOD 2000 was always to be a trio. In reality, Draws' introduction to the group played out much later, but early on it looked like the WWF wanted LOD 2000 to consist of three people. It might be a little hard to see, but Hawk and Animal are both named, but the third member has a question mark underneath his artwork. An idea was to have LOD come out in what looks like camouflage gear. The notes say that their spikes would include razor blades, and all three members would also wear variations of hockey masks. Also included is some concept art for Sonny, who served as LOD 2000's manager for a brief period of time. Here's Adam Bomb looking pretty similar to the finished product. You can instantly tell here that this is Adam Bomb. But then take a look at this. The notes say that Adam Bomb is a soldier of fortune. He's a master of all weapons. And it also notes that there's many possibilities for costume variations. Keep soldier of fortune in mind and then take a look at this. I'm not so sure what the numbers are supposed to represent, but this is so far away from the finished version of Atom Bomb that you can tell that they were really trying anything to see what stuck and what didn't. Take a look at these drawings here and pay attention to the RM on Atom's gear. You know what that stands for? It stands for Ringmaster. Yep, an early idea for Adam Bomb was the Ringmaster. Imagine if Brian Clark became the Ringmaster and Steve Austin became Adam Bomb. I think these ideas here are kind of blending the Ringmaster and the Atom Bomb characters together. But eventually the decision was made to just go with Atom Bomb and creative got to work on Atom's trademark goggles. The initial idea for Doink was to seemingly make him as terrifying as possible. And it's a shame they didn't go along with some of these designs, even changing the face paint up every now and then would have been good. This one here shows Doink without the green wig. And this one shows Doink with the creepy spiked teeth along with his water spraying flower. This is something that would get implemented into the finished character. Here's a more complete and finished version of Doink, and here we have Matt Osborne copying the pose from the concept art. I do like these early versions of Doink though, but I'm not so sure if the WWF wanted to go full throttle and scare the shit out of kids. Doink got a little creepy every now and then, but these earlier versions could be complete nightmare fuel for younger viewers. Mick Foley's Dude Love character was dreamt up long before Foley made his WWF debut. 
But in 1997, the hippest cat in the land would walk out on WWF Raw to help Stone Cold Steve Austin. The concept designs here are pretty much what we ended up getting with the exception of the denim vest, the colour of the boots and a change to the headband. The wristbands were also not featured on the finished version but Mick added something that was maybe even better, a tie-dye version of the mandible claw. Everything else here though is pretty spot on, the logo, the shirt and the tights all made appearances on TV. What I find way more interesting though is the concept designs for Mankind, known during these early days of character development as Headcase. The notes here describe Mankind's mask as full metal with leather straps attached to it. While the finished mask would look more like it was all made of leather, the original idea was for Mankind to have a metal mask. Notes also state that Headcase's attire would be distressed, looking sweaty and grimy and straps and hooks would be used on Foley's attire that kind of gave us the impression that Mankind had to be restrained. Mankind, without a doubt, is one of the most unique characters in WWF history, and it feels wrong to say they should have done things differently, but the early designs for Mankind looked incredibly good in my opinion. What you may not know, however, was that the Mankind mask was actually first developed for The Undertaker. Revealed recently by The Undertaker himself on the WWE Treasure series, the leather mask that Mankind wore was actually originally designed for the dead man. Remember back in 1995 when Mabel fractured the Undertaker's orbital bone? Well, the creative team designed the Mankind mask back then. But it was decided that the Undertaker would instead use the Phantom mask, and the Mankind version was saved for Mick Foley. There's around 50 designs for the babyface Kona Crush from 1992, including a ton of logos, some we would see on TV and some we wouldn't. There's a couple of images that look like the finished version of Crush, but there's also some really weird pieces here, including this one that kind of reminds me of Demolition Crush. There's also this one right here where Bran is wearing a netted tank top. And there's loads of others that show different singlet designs, all of which would never get past the design phase. In the end, Crush's ring gear was way more basic than the design shown off here. Maybe it was a case of creative being a little too creative. We have some early 1995 Hunter Hearst Helmsley designs and it looks like the same artist who drew the Diesel stuff also worked on these Triple H concepts. Hunter was known by his WCW gimmick name here, Jean-Paul Levesque, and the notes state here that Levesque was supposed to have a butler named Charles. It says that Paul would go nowhere without Charles, so we assume that Charles could have acted like some sort of manager for Jean-Paul Levesque. It also states that Levesque was a member of the royal family. There's a few more designs too from 1996, have a look. Erwin R. Scheister has a very basic wrestling attire but early concept art shows us that it was initially going to be a little different. The formal gear he wore was once going to look more like a blend of wrestling and business wear and there was also a couple of colour variants. A note states that someone wanted a wider styled shirt on one of the character designs, maybe this was Mike himself who requested this or maybe it was someone else in creative, who knows. But it's interesting to think that something as plain as IRS's ring gear would need to go through a design phase. Here's some early design ideas for Papa Shango. There were a couple of different ideas for his face paint but in the end I think they settled on the best one. From the notes, it looks like the WWF always knew he was going to be some sort of voodoo practitioner, and many of his traits can be seen through the various pieces of artwork here, but I think this is a case of the finished product being even better than the concept ideas. Papa Shango sure was a memorable character.
When Shawn Michaels broke up the Rockers in late 1991, HBK would have to ditch the colourful gear he wore in the tag team and try on something new. Initial plans saw Shawn Michaels being decked out in complete biker gear, and we kinda got to see what this would look like when Marty Jannetty tripped and fell through the barber shop window, but Shawn's gear wasn't quite as detailed as the stuff right here. Something to point out is the tights in the centre picture, you can kinda see the early designs here of the tights Shawn would eventually wear in the WWF, but yeah, I'm glad they didn't go with this stuff, especially that denim shirt design. Sean's ring gear would become pretty iconic and he's had some great looking attires and colour schemes. Two ladies by the names of Julie and Terry were fans of the rockers and they gave Marty and Sean ring attires for free. Sean liked the gear so much that he decided to trust Julie to make every piece of his ring gear throughout the remainder of his career. Sean says he never questioned Julie or gave her direction. She had new stuff for Sean every month or so and Sean would wear anything that she made. Both Julie and Terry ended up getting hired as costume designers for the WWF thanks to their work on Sean's ring gear. The amount of concept art for Max Moon is truly staggering, and the amount of sheer detail that the designers put into this outfit is absolutely insane. This is easily the most thought out and idea filled costume out of this whole set of concept art. But gonna be honest here, I busted out laughing after reading all these design notes and then finally looking at the actual finished Max Moon costume again. It was always gonna be a very ambitious task of making all of this come to life. It's a comic book character or a cartoon character through and through. Maybe the design team got carried away or maybe they were given specific instructions. But the Max Moon character entertains fans nowadays for all the wrong reasons and most of that is thanks to the outfit. Here's some mask designs too that never got implemented in the end. Yokozuna had a lot of different colour variations and I'm not so sure about this pink and blue effort. But the black and white version here was used on WWF programming. Hasbro also made an action figure featuring this exact attire. It looked like Yokozuna's overall design was already set in stone and the designers were just playing around with different colour schemes. The Repo Man's ring attire is pretty self explanatory but I just can't explain this. This one here looks more like the Repo Man we all know, but it's got a kinda futuristic twist. And then we have a few other designs that are just absolutely crazy. The Repo Man did eventually make changes to his ring attire that many people forget about. And finally, here's Ricky the Dragon Steamboat with a big emphasis on the dragon. It looks like there were plans for Steamer Smoke to come out of his unique entrance gear at one point. And there's some artwork here of Ricky's that's very close to the finished character we would see on TV. And that's it, I hope you enjoyed looking at these early character designs and I hope you found them as intriguing as I did. Everything you see here is on the WWE's website, so have a look if you want to check out more of the notes and all that good stuff. I find it really fascinating looking at how these characters developed and thinking about what could have been. The Mankind stuff and the Bret Hart stuff in particular is interesting to me and it goes to show that the overall presentation of a wrestler can really sway our opinions. Had Bret Hart came out as that futuristic archer or whatever it was, then we instantly think that it would have been a colossal failure. But anyway, thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it and take care.